and given people some suggestions and sometimes some help with CASP, I think, uh, in general, CASP is not studying the question that we're interested in folding at home. And when CASP is interested in just predicting the final structure of a protein, and what we're interested in is studying things where either the final structure would be very straightforward to get experimentally, and so we would just go to the experimental crystal structure, mm. or where the final structure is very challenging and is of a different type than what CAS does, such as the structures, the intermediate structures involved in Alzheimer's. That's not a type of structure that um, the CASP-like approaches would work. Okay. So I think, you know, CASP is an interesting problem, but it's sort of very different and unrelated to questions involving like Alzheimer's and Huntington's and all of these things. All right. Uh, and I just want to remind the audience here, uh, we'll probably be uh, talking here for a few more minutes, but uh, if you have any um, questions, be sure to ask them in the chat that's going along with the program, and I'll see if I can get to them if they are related to what we are uh, talking about here. And uh, one, another question, a little more technical, uh, from one of our bioscience viewers here. Uh, can folding at home reliably model the binding mode of a small molecule ligand? Yeah, so I think we have some papers published for being able to predict both the binding mode and oh, the affinity, which, oh, okay. uh, which is even harder. But um, one of the greatest challenges for predicting things like um, binding modes and affinities is whether there's allosteric involved in the protein, whether the protein changes shape when the uh, small molecule binds. When there's not a great deal of allosteric, I think you're doing reasonably well with predicting binding modes, albeit it's a, still a very large-scale calculation. When there is Alistair, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's when uh, things get really difficult. I think the next five to ten years will be combining the work that we've done with protein folding with the work that we're doing with uh, small molecule binding such that uh -huh. we can incorporate the, the change in shape of the protein that would come along. Okay, I see. Um, and then I've got another question that's uh, perhaps a little bit uh, uh, technical, but I, I think you've covered it in, in prior talks about uh, how are the simulations guided? What are the physics behind it by uh, energy functions or uh, uh, somewhat by comparison with known foldings of similar proteins? Um, yeah. So most of everything that we do um, is, I would like, actually essentially all of what we do is driven by physically based force fields. Okay. And so the force fields derive either from comparison experiments or from uh, often these days directly from quantum mechanics, and so they don't uh, appeal to like the protein data bank for particular uh -huh. uh, information and so on. I think one of the real benefits of studying something with a physics-based force field is what's called transferability. And I think the most beautiful example of transferability was when um, Newton studied, let's say, how uh, you know apples fell on the earth, yeah. and the theory for how apples fell on the earth allowed him to predict how the planets moved around in space. And you know, actually at the time, there were all these informatic models for how the planets moved, where they just sort of watched or recorded and interpolated. Mm -hmm. And these informatic models can be very powerful, but they sort of lack this key form of transferability. They do well in the regime in which there's a lot of experimental data. Okay. And so I think um, when we're talking about doing something with Alzheimer's disease, that's where a transferable potential, I think, is really, really important because it's unclear to me whether the data with PDB is going to be really all that relevant or something that doesn't behave like a folded protein. Or all right. So, but you do use uh, quantum mechanics at, uh, in your uh, folding process, your simulation? Yeah so, yeah. so we take advantage of the work uh, done by others to use quantum mechanics to, um, to come up with uh, sort of the, the nature of the forces and energies for how these things interact. Okay. These simulations that we do almost all the time are purely um, classical simulations, but they're classical simulations with quantum mechanical parameters. Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, I know you had mentioned a classical uh, basis to the simulations before, um, okay. so I wanted to kind of... Uh, yeah, for the, types of questions we're, for the types of questions we're interested in, all the time skills we're interested in, the classical formulation is really not an issue. I think if we were only interested in very, very short time scales, then quantum dynamics and other things would probably be important. But uh, for those of you who are very technical, I think you know there's this concept of a memory function after which the, the dynamics is just purely grounded. Okay. And, you know, interest in stuff on very long time scales. Yes, yeah, long time scales. Uh, I've got another question here about, uh, uh, another technical question about uh, the folding process and about using open software, like OpenMM, rather than MPI, um, Open Molecular, uh, are you familiar with OpenMM? 
Yeah, I mean, do, do you mean OpenMP instead of uh, or OpenMM? Because they're two very different things. Oh, right. Yes. I, you know, I, in my notes, I didn't write that down. OpenMM is o molecular. Uh, yeah, so OpenMM you know. is actually a, a package that uh, my group, in collaboration with the NIH Center at Stanford, Symbios, is developing. Oh, okay. OpenMP is, Open is the software that's probably most similar to MPI. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so, I think so, that's um, what the question was. Yeah, for, for our code, um, rehauling it into uh, overhauling it from MPI to Open MM, it, I'm sorry, Open MP is both going to be a lot of work and probably not going to yield much performance. Uh, okay. But we are looking at switching from MPI for the SMP version to just a purely threads based solution. And this is the so called SMP2 client, which we have sort of uh, testing in house and uh, we uh, hope to uh, sort of send out sometime in 2009. Okay, Depends so on. Uh, it, it's probably not going to be January. We'll see. You know how probably it'll go into first Q and A in house in February, and depending on how Q and A goes, uh, if Q A looks good, then um, you know maybe it could be out in March or April. If Q A you know has found some problems, then it could take longer. I'm hoping for March or April, but we'll see. Okay, March or April. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Yes. Uh, and then there's another one about uh, GPU. Question about uh, the GPU coding. Or uh, uh, language uh, is it currently uh, CUDA that's used, and what do you think about OpenCL? If you have knowledge of those, yeah. So we use CUDA on NVIDIA GPUs and Brook on ATI. Brook, uh, Brook I mean, uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, ATI is depreciating Brook, I think, uh, in favor of OpenCL. And OpenCL is actually fairly similar to CUDA, so we probably should could be able to take our um, CUDA code and port it to OpenCL and get pretty good performance on ATI, maybe better performance, I don't know, than what we're getting on Brook. The, um, the appeal of OpenCL is to have one common code base. The uh, reason why I, I'm not excited about running OpenCL on NVIDIA right now is that our NVIDIA port is very highly tuned to CUDA, and um, I wouldn't expect OpenCL to expose everything that we get in CUDA. So since if we didn't have anything, we probably would just do OpenCL and have something run on both platforms. But since we already have a highly tuned CUDA port, we're probably not going to throw that away. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I just uh, I wanted to say a mention in the chat once again. I see a couple of people did ask some questions, and we did cover uh, about untapped potential as far as pre-installing folding on different uh, uh, computing platforms, and it is pre-installed on ATI uh, graphics cards and also PS3s, and they do work. I just want to let the viewers know that uh, uh, Dr. Pandey uh, does work with, uh, uh, you know, they're in communication, let's say, with some other companies. Never know how that stuff is going to work out, though. Uh, so, uh, just uh, any final words about folding at home? Any encouragement you can give for all the teams out there uh, for the next year? Uh, coming up yeah, no, so we're, we're excited about, I think, the, uh, what's going to come out this year. Uh, you know, I think uh, releasing a whole new server back end should make everyone's life a lot easier. I think a lot of people donate from their home really uh, spend a lot of time just working to keep things going on their end, and we really appreciate that. And over the last two years, we've been uh, rewriting the server code from scratch, so hopefully that will uh, make a big impact. I think the SMP2 client coming out uh, will help people running SMP and make that hopefully a lot more streamlined. It doesn't use MPI, so I think it'll be a lot easier to install. Mm. And that's something that we could hope to start asking to see if it could possibly get pre-installed. We're also, I think, near the end of the year, um, hopefully going to release a uh, client from a whole new code base. Great. The current code base has been around, you know, it's a it's legacy code from the original, uh, from the oh. code that arrived in 2000, wow. with uh, gradually being added onto it. Um, we've been uh, working really well with... Uh, uh, Joe Coughlin, uh, who's president of uh, Cauldron uh, Development uh, Program Company, and they're the ones who have uh, spearheaded the uh, server code and actually helping out with the SMP2 code. And so the next uh, job up for Joe and his team, I think, will be a whole new client that is uh, basically rewritten from scratch. And I think that will, I think, make life a lot easier for donors who, you know, really spend a lot of time having to manage these clients. Yeah. So my hope is. But in 2009, we'll make it a lot easier to run something or whatever. Right. I do notice that a lot of people, when they first start out, they do, you know, if they're not exactly computer savvy, uh, they may find the different clients, you know, trying to get the GPU client and, and whatnot. Uh, uh, it might be a little bit confusing, but, uh, yeah, any, any improvements yeah. will be, of course, welcome, and we'll look forward to that later in 2009. And on that note, I want to thank you 